My name is Alexander Petikov. I've always been fascinated by the unknown and the mysterious. This has led me to travel all over the world in search of various cryptids, like Sasquatch or the Loch Ness Monster, or the UFO phenomenon, and even mysterious places like North Korea. I've accompanied Seth Breedlove and the Small Town Monsters crew on quite a few adventures around the United States. But sometimes the greatest mystery you're faced with might just be closer to you than the rest. That's what this story is about. New Hampshire is the fifth smallest state in the United States, but with a population of under 1.4 million, it's the tenth least populated. While not filled with humans, it is however filled with endless forests, rugged mountains, rolling hills, rivers, and lakes. In fact, it is the second most forested state in the Union, coming in at 84% forested, just after neighboring Maine. This makes the state an ideal habitat for thousands of moose, black bear, deer, and all sorts of other woodland wildlife. New Hampshire has also been home to some unusual phenomenon over the years. There are stories of native burial grounds, haunted mountains, graveyards, and colonial ghosts. When it comes to UFOs, one of the most famous and well-known abduction stories of all time, the Betty and Barney Hill incident, took place right in the White Mountains in 1961. In 1965, the Exeter UFO incident took place on New Hampshire's seacoast, involving multiple officers and strange lights in the sky. While not well known for it, stories of Bigfoot-like creatures have been reported across the state for decades. There are old logging stories of tall hairy creatures known as wood devils in the Great North Woods region of Coaz County, as well as tales of strange howls at night in the mountains. There's a lot of sightings in usually in the fall, spring, fall time. I know, you know, there are there are all year round. People do see them year round. I mean, maybe people just aren't reporting it. We do get a lot of that here in the state of New Hampshire where people don't even want to report because they're they're afraid of ridicule and or trespassers. They don't want anybody on their land. So I do run into that a lot. I would say about 98% of my cases, they don't want anybody to know. Uh, I had a really good class A encounter that the gentleman was, was really nervous and he was a police officer and he didn't want his neighbors to even know. The Hollis Flea Monster of 1977 was a Sasquatch-like creature reported by multiple people in the small southern New Hampshire town of Hollis. The most notable encounter happening at the Hollis Flea Market in which a man and his sons were terrified by something shaking their trailer one evening, leading to a face-to-face -face encounter. In 1979, a mineral collector was bushwhacking a remote section of the Ospie mountain range when he came across a large, hairy, man-like creature inside of a stone structure. It let out a guttural sound that sent him and his companions running. These types of stories aren't all that uncommon and likely mostly go under the radar. When I first took over doing the cases for the state of New Hampshire, I thought that there would be a lot more cases up north, more woods. But in you know putting them and plotting them on my chart, I realized that the sightings are going to be where the people are. So there's not as many up north as I would have anticipated. They're all over the state of New Hampshire. They're here. People see them a lot. I just think we have, I don't, I don't know if it's less population, but we definitely have a lot of woods. And, and even, you know, the guys from Finding Bigfoot, when they came up here, they likened it to like Washington State with the amount of trees that we have. I've hiked and explored all over New Hampshire. I've also heard a fair amount of Sasquatch stories and interviewed some eyewitnesses and those involved. But this case I'm about to describe sort of fell into my lap. 
there's this area of New Hampshire I've known for a number of years, and it wasn't until about the summer of 2019, a friend of mine named Josh was coming up for a weekend camping, and we decided to check out some spots in New Hampshire. I'd only camped out in this area a few times many years prior to August of 2019, so uh, Josh and I decided to head out there for the night, and you know, we got there, we were starting to set up, it was getting dark, uh, we were in this little clearing, as we were, I think, milling around the, the campsite, uh, I don't remember if it was you or I that heard it first, but we heard some stuff off in the woods, and we, you know, we were shining some lights on, and I know at least I walked up, I think, a couple times, and, you know, got near the woods and just tried to tried to see if, what we could see, if it was, you know, a uh, little critter or something of that nature. And that was our first thought, I think, that it was um, something like that, something, you know, very run-of-the-mill. So we were in a sort of a circular oval-shaped clearing surrounded by woods on, and trees on, on either side. So at one point we started hearing movement, just leaves crunching something, walking around. Not unusual for this area, there's a very healthy population of moose, deer, porcupine, fox, coyote, a raccoon, all sorts of critters, uh, rabbits, every sort of woodland critter in the northeast you can imagine, lots of bears as well. But what would happen is from one direction we would hear the movement we kind of focus on that area with our flashlights uh, and a couple times we would hear it coming from say behind us we'd focus on that area then we'd hear movement coming from diagonally across from us in the other direction then we'd hear it from another side so it was almost like it was in three different areas and every time we we'd even get closer to the woods with our flashlights to try and maybe see what it was that was in there all right for the record it's uh let's see is 10 five right now we're just chilling here with our campfire and there's something right in there just breaking sticks or moving around or doing something I don't know what it is didn't pay much mind to it I think for me the the reason that I you know didn't think anything of it at first is it it seemed to happen and then it and it kind of kept going for a while it might have sort of quieted down and then and then it'd be picked back up where we're you know, let's say we're back at the, the fire and all of a sudden we hear some crunching again and kind of perks our interest, but it was to the point where it was long enough where it's, oh, it's gotta be nothing, you know, it can't be, especially if you're, if you want to throw Bigfoot into it, there's no way, you know, there's no way there's, there's a Sasquatch walking around and it's hanging out here for that long. You think, it, you know, that something in that area would be gone. So, um, I didn't, I didn't give it much mind at first. And, um, to be honest, if you hadn't gotten the audio that night on the recorder, um, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, in the tent, we may not even be talking about it as Bigfoot. That night, as I usually do when I'm camping, I set up an audio recorder in my tent, and as we started to drift off to sleep, we heard some coyotes going off, very normal for this area. I hear them all the time out there. I didn't actually review the audio from that night um, because the audio recorder had low battery and it was only about one bar of battery left so I'm not sure how that la how long that lasted. It turned out to only last about 45 minutes to an hour and I didn't review that audio until months later um, because in the meantime you know we we had spent that weekend camping we camped in this spot and we actually went to a different area the second night so we weren't in the same area. In conversations with some friends in the BFRO I discovered that they had done actually an investigation in an area not too far from this wooded area where we were camping and where I like to frequent. I had heard some stories, you know, there's BFRO reports and other big reports in towns and areas around there. I mean, New Hampshire has a fair amount of sightings in some of these areas as I've discovered over the years. But it was after talking to Dave McCullough about this case, learning that geographically this area where they had done this case was virtually up the street, the closest practically property to this rural wooded area, which is conservation areas combined with a state forest, thousands of acres. I went and reviewed my audio and it absolutely blew me away because right after he drifted off to sleep, we started getting what sounded like wood knocks. Wood knocks, movements, things moving around. Now that could be anything, but one of the knocks was quite loud and, and really not going to jump to the conclusion and say it was Sasquatch, but it sounded very intriguing. So I'll play that recording as well as some of the others. That's kind of where the story stopped for a while. It was interesting, um, but you know, life goes on. It 
wasn't actually until the world basically shut down in early 2020, lockdowns due to COVID, I started working from home. I had a lot more free time on my hands instead of driving back and forth. So once finishing work at home every day, I would go out to this patch of woods and I'm heading out to this spot almost every day. And I did actually have a moose encounter with a female moose there and I was finding lots of sign, very interesting. And of course, somebody that's interested in this subject, you think, you know, this Bigfoot is always lingering close in your head. And I try to be as rational as I can when I'm out in the woods and I've encountered plenty of other uh, wildlife in that particular area. So after spending the better part of five or six months going in and out of the spot almost daily, there were quite a few instances where there were some unusual things that happened, primarily wood knock type things, trees knocked over in unusual times when there were no wind. A couple of the instances included in March hearing a clear, crisp knock while with my brother. Unfortunately, right as I was getting my audio recorder, that's when that happened. And once I got the audio recorder out, nothing else happened. There's another instance in April with a friend of mine where we had heard some sort of knocks uh, right after we had both had a feeling that we're being watched. And at the moment where I was thinking I was being watched, my friend blurted out, I think we're being watched. And it was this really weird moment. I've never experienced that. And we heard for about 10 minutes, four or five times, something breaking a branch and making knocks. So there was instances on and off that kept going on. So while this was all going on, I actually was put in contact with the property owner, Chris, who had had all this sort of stuff happening at his house, which was the closest property to this wooded area. All right, so I'm now heading out to meet with Chris. He is the property owner in this case, in this story, I suppose. I uh, originally didn't know him when I first started having stuff happen. Uh, would definitely be interesting to hear his full story now, and um, I hope that that will uh, kind of illuminate a little bit more about this case. All right, so we're here with Chris. We're going to talk to him about some of the experiences he's had here. I've had some strange experiences, but I never, uh, I never. Uh, thought that there had anything to do with Sasquatch. I thought Sasquatch was only out west, northwest. But I didn't even start thinking of Sasquatch until this was, it would be in March five years ago when I was walking in the nearby forest and I heard three tree knocks. I heard it up ahead of the tr in the trail and I knew it was in the middle of the forest. So I walked another hundred feet and another three tree knocks. And I said, this is kind of weird. But then I kept walking and nothing more. So I put it out of my mind. Then, uh, this, that was the end of March, end of April. Uh, my son was here, we were, my wife and I, we were up at the house, it was 10 at night. All of a sudden this relatively large rock hit the side of the house, really loud whack, you know. So my son and I immediately went out the front door couldn't see anything. Um, the house faces away from the road, so it wouldn't be somebody from the road. And whoever threw the rock had to have been right out in my yard in the fog, but we couldn't see anything. And that was weird, and I didn't know what that was. Um, it was kind of strange. But then the next month, May, uh, I was driving down uh, the road next to a nearby river. It was noontime. And in a place where the river veered off the road, there was uh, this being on four, all fours. It had long hair, didn't have fur, it had hair. Hair was six to eight inches long. It was about maybe 100, 150, 200 feet away from the car. I couldn't see the head because there was a branch in the way. It was a cinnamon reddish brown, light reddish brown. I mean, there's something called cinnamon bears, but they don't have long hair, they have fur. And this was clearly long hair all over, hanging down straight along the arms, and the arms are longer than the legs. Um, I estimated the shoulders on all fours, it was about 
five feet. So if it stood up, it would have been about eight feet tall. And in this river, the state of New Hampshire stocks it with fish. So it was, uh, I figure it was looking for, it looked like it was fishing. I mean, that's literally what it looks like. So then I, I started thinking about all the other strange things that had happened, including the tree knocks and the um, rock against the house. And, uh, and then I started thinking back to other things that had happened, like the, um, out in my orchard, I have a pear tree. In the first year I had pears, this was probably maybe eight years ago. It was filled with pears, had maybe 20 pears on them. They were getting ripe. In my mind, I said, you know, I'm going to come out with a basket in the morning and pick them all. I went out the next morning, everyone was gone. <laughs> and there was none on the ground. I know when deer eat my apples, you know, they always leave half an apple. And there's, you get on the ground, there's littered with parts of apples. But there was no parts, nothing. Whoever had taken it, taken them off the tree. And they had taken it pretty roughly because they had broken some branches and um, they had taken, there was pears as high as like eight, ten feet tall and those were all gone too. Let's see what else. Uh, we've heard three times uh, the loud sound of a woman screaming in the woods. The, the most dramatic one was, uh, you know, I worked down here in my shop and then at night Especially in the winter, it's, it's dark by the time I finish, and so I have to walk up the house, which is up the hill. And this probably happened maybe 10 years ago. So I walked up the road, and right next to the, my mailbox is a big old oak tree. Just as I came up towards that oak tree was this really overpowering smell of wet dog. Um, not a terrible smell, just literally like a wet dog. And I, at the time, there were no dogs on the street. I don't think a dog would just sit there and watch me, but whatever it was, was, was just motionless and was right there. I, I walked past it and the smell went away. I walked back and the smell was really strong. I walked to the right, smell got stronger. I went to the left, it got weaker. So I knew whatever it was, was like literally 10 feet from me right on the side of the road, but I couldn't see it, it was too dark. I figured in order to put out a smell to project over 10 feet, it's got to be a really big animal. After that May where I saw it in the river, uh, it was midnight, this was in June, I believe. I had gone to bed with my wife and I smelled, the windows were open, I smelled the smoke a little bit. And I'm always worried about, you know, fires. So I walked in the other room overlooking the yard and uh, I looked, I, the, screen, I, the window was open, I just put my nose to the screen and I smelled the smoke and I didn't know where I was coming from. So my nose was literally right up against the screen like this and a rock hit the screen like inches from my head. But then right down, I have a pond down here and from the house I was looking across the pond and there was a ball of light about, about that big, just stationary in a bush right next to the pond and this ball of light was just right in the bush. And I, was, I looked at it, probably 20 minutes, I watched that light, didn't move, and then eventually it just disappeared. That's what caused me to call the BFRO. Um, I was pretty freaked out at that point. Okay, so I just got done interviewing Chris and talking to him about the case here in his, on his property and the woods surrounding. Knowing from what I've heard from other folks in this surrounding area, some of the other towns not too far from where we are in this wooded area, a friend of mine, one of his neighbors actually was having rocks thrown in his house. Uh, then I heard a story from a gentleman who contacted me saying that there was a, even uh, a farm out there where they claimed that there was Sasquatch coming out and picking blueberries every, every point in the year where the blueberries would ripen. And other stories, you have you know, famous stories just kind of surrounding this area. Uh, even friends of mine that have had encounters. So it's really interesting talking to Chris and just knowing that. Going forward, it'll be interesting to see. Chris mentioned reporting his incident to the BFRO. While the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization is somewhat controversial in some Bigfoot researching circles, they've done some great work since the 1990s and have countless local researchers across the country taking up cases. So I followed up with two BFRO researchers from New England that were involved in the investigation of Chris's case. 
Yeah, I got a call from uh, Jeff Shepard. He's a fellow Squatchusetts BFRO, uh, Massachusetts researcher. Um, he gave me a call one night, and the spur of the moment, they were looking for some people involved in Sasquatch to um, see if they wanted to come by this property case where a lot of stuff was going on. So uh, last minute, I went, met the homeowner, took us around the property, gave us gave us a lot of stuff that's going on over the years, and um, great place, just a really great place with a lot of history. I was asked to go do a site visit with Jeff uh, to go down to Chris's site. He's had a lot of interesting stuff going on on his property. Just to hear the history of, of the area and for him to take us around, he had taken us down to the area where uh, a moose had gotten caught up in um, some of that netting and had died. And he had, uh, I guess he had a bunch of stuff going on around that moose carcass that was down there. I know he was having calls and he had rocks thrown. Chris had taken us over to another area. We all went to the end of a road down along the pond and we were doing some, some stuff, just some chatter, a couple of whoops and knocks, nothing at all, it was pretty quiet. Everyone was leaving, we were going back to the end of the pond and they were gone probably good five minutes and you could barely see them and um, we weren't saying nothing, we were just being quiet, waiting and waiting, nothing, nothing. As Soon as we went to, like we were whispering to each other but we stopped, hey, you wanna head out now? As Soon as we took a step or two, it was, I could literally hear it bending and cracking and then crack, slam, slammed into the ground and we both just jumped and Jeff actually had his theorem on. I had, I had one but I didn't have it uh, recording and he could not see anything and I'm like, it has to be. It happened 30 yards away, this tree came crashing down and um, you could literally, and there was no wind, nothing else went down, not another tree moved and um, it was pretty intense and he just, we both looked at each other and didn't say a word. Did you say that? Did you hear that? Did you hear that? And. Uh, I was like, Jeff, I can't believe you can't see nothing. It, there has to be something there, something just knocked that over. And it, it was either jumped behind something really quick. There was the um, old stone walls, border walls that go around, a lot of them in New England. But we didn't hear no noise. After the crash, you would have heard something running away. Or it was just very uh, baffling as to what caused that. And uh, we both had a feeling what it was, but we had Nothing to show for it. He scanned. This thing couldn't have got away that fast. I was further ahead of Jeff and Dave, and uh, I did hear a snap, but I didn't know it was a tree. I was further up the trail, and when I turned around, um, they were stopped. I could just see their lights, so I went back to see what they were doing, and they were scouring the woods looking for any sign of anything because the tree had been pushed over. So, but I didn't see anything or hear anything else, unfortunately, that night. And we waited and waited. We figured the other three people were taking time. That was Jeff, Crystal, and Dave. They came back and they said, wow, he says, just after we left, it was a loud crash, like either a large branch or somebody threw a huge rock right near them. After talking to Chris, Dave, and Crystal, I decided to invite Josh out in order to spend a night in the spot and investigate it further. It was going to be a cold winter night, but we were definitely prepared. All right, so this is the gear we're gonna be bringing out. Obviously, there's a lot of it. There's clothes and tents and tripods. That's, I'm not gonna show that. It's gonna be very cold, so we have lots of hand warmers, foot warmers, general warmers. You got your first aid kit, with all the essentials, uh, bandage to stop bleeding some tinder, fire starting stuff, some emergency heat in a can. If you can see that, if it'll focus, yeah. Um, heat blankets, very important. You might line the tent with that. Spare heat blankets. Little camping stove. So this is a little guy that you put onto these little kind of um, gas cans, which is nice. Lighter fluid, it's very cold. So we're gonna have to kind of work with what we have here. Obviously hatchets. Um, portable shovel, I think this is always useful. Extra fire starting stuff, this is kind of neat. It's a little, uh, starts a little spark, so it's kind of cool. 
extra saw. This is a handheld saw. What else? Glow stick. Uh, more into the gear side of stuff. We're going to be bringing some walkies just in case we happen to split up a little bit. Obviously some protection. Just your standard 9mm. Uh, with uh, This one actually has a flashlight and a laser on it. So just self-protection just in case. Headlamps, lights are crucial, some high quality lights. We're going to be bringing this trail camera out as well. Uh, deploying that maybe away from camp, which will be awesome. Fleur Scout, of course. That'll be cool to test out. Always good to have in the field. Paracord, lots of paracord. Parabolic dish. Since actually thanks to my buddy Carrick, Crash Course Cryptozoology. So that'll be cool to try that out. Then we've got Zoom audio recorders. We're going to bring a bunch of these. Uh, one to hook up to the parabolic dish to record. This one will be, um, well, we have a few, but just in case, you know, for, for audio as well. Then we got food, of course. This is just a little bit of work. I'm going to be bringing some beef stew. There's a lot of other stuff, but this is kind of the basics. This is uh, this is actually the spot where we had those knocks, where the incident kind of happened. So, pretty interesting. Not a lot here, obviously, but basically, we were camped here by this little fire pit, and um, we had stuff walking around in the bushes, all in these areas, kind of around. And we had knocks that night from the audio recorder. Yep. So. Check this out. These are classic New England stone walls. Now these are found all over the place. A lot of the land here in New Hampshire, as well as other parts of New England, was actually completely logged out hundreds of years ago. And it's all recovered forest now. So you'll find these in the woods just all over the place. Just an interesting fact about the woods here in New England. All right, so let's uh, check this out here. So you've got all these trees kind of mangled up here. I'm gonna get over here to get a little bit of a better, better angle. Now, some people might say that this is uh, what you'd call a tree structure, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, supposedly Bigfoot activity. One thing you gotta look for is did the trees originate in this area? Yeah, it's funny because I mean, they're they're dead. There's no limbs on them. You know, this is one of those things where this is what this is what you're gonna find out in the middle of the woods out here off trail. I mean, this is you know things things can just kind of occur naturally, and this is what you get. But still, nonetheless, it's it's kind of interesting to take a second look at it and you know just try to figure out okay, you know what might have caused it in the first place. So here's the fun part. Time to chop some wood for a fire. We gotta get a fire started right away, so let's get to it.
All right, well, we finally got our fire going. Nice to get some warmth up in here. So uh, we're gonna start just kind of hanging out, feeding the fire, staying warm as we can. It's gonna be, you know, the highs are in the, in the single, no, not single digits, excuse me. The highs tonight are going to be in the teens. So should be pretty interesting. So always good to have a source of warmth. Oh, yeah. And it's really toasty right here, I love it. I think the wind's gonna keep it going, honestly. Yeah. We'll get down to the brook and then just kind of hook a right and we'll just follow it down a little bit towards where it flattens out, maybe where the uh, swamp starts starts up. I think that might be a good spot to cut this thing out. I'm gonna have to pick that around. I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna go into the settings here on setup mode and I'm actually gonna switch to video. Something I haven't used a lot, so I figure this is a good time to try it out instead of taking Stills, we'll uh, let's see if we can get anything on here and maybe trigger a, a 10 second video. All right, what are we hearing? I thought I heard like a I don't really know how to describe it, like a, maybe a bird or something, like some kind of, what did, what did you hear? Cause I don't, So it was a little muffled, but. Yeah, I had like three hoods on, so I didn't really hear much of what that was. At first I thought it was like a, you know, it could be branches too, you know how when they, when they uh, hit each other up top in the trees, they might just make that kind of scratchy, right. scratchy high pitch, you know, rubbing. That's kind of what I thought it was at first, but. So yeah, we just heard, I mean, it, Kind of was like a scream kind of sound. I yeah. don't know, call. Yeah. I guess let's hear, see if we can't hear anything else. All right, so we're gonna try out the parabolic dish here. I'm headphoned up to this uh, the Zoom audio. So what we'll do is, then we'll turn this guy on. See what we can't hear, so give that a try. So I'm not really hearing much at all for the moment, um, but it's amazing. I mean, I can point this right back at camp and hear the the fire. I can point at the river, hear the water flowing like it's right next to me. just heard some kind of a... What did you think you heard? I don't know, it was just like a little... Right? Yeah, like a... Exactly. That's exactly That's what I major, heard. major, small, but... I don't know what that was. All right, so as we sit here by the fire, we keep hearing noises. I mean, I don't know if it's in our head, but we definitely heard some small critters. Thought I heard something that sounded like a knock. Uh, problem is it's windy too, so there's nothing really, nothing definitive. It's quite an area, I gotta say. We have the moon right above us. It's very brightly lit right now. We can, yeah, I mean, you would be able to see something moving around, so pretty interesting. So yeah, here we are, man, middle of nowhere. Not a lot of people would be in this situation, I don't think. No, nope. we're kind of crazy to be out here, but I don't do as much in the winter. But yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to feel like I, you know, those four or five months I have to just stay, stay put. Stay inside, and, cabin fevers. Yeah. And well, as you mentioned, I mean, a lot of you made. You said something earlier. You know, we can just go back home anytime we want. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be out here. 
animals that live out here, this is their full-time yep. load. So, I mean, what does that mean for something like a Sasquatch? Would they, I mean, I don't know. I've heard there's been activity in this area, you know, in, up into March, I've heard knocks. You said year round. It seems so, like I mean, I don't know. Chris has said it's kind of a little bit slower in the winter and a lot of people think that, but I mean, so far it's been pretty uneventful. The wind has stopped. We did hear that one noise. Yep. It's nothing I could really point to. I mean, for me, yeah. I have to be, I, unfortunately, I have to be slapped in the face before I can really, you know, Right, it's tough to, I manage. mean, there's other critters out here, obviously, yeah. so it could be a whole host of things. One of the keys here to camping in this kind of, sleeping this kind of weather is, get your sleeping bag, right? Take your jacket, zip it up, and pull this, pull your legs through this guy. Keep your lower body nice and warm. So now I got this going on. Not too bad. Works. Inside of the tent right now. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm feeling pretty warm, honestly. We got these heat blankets on top of our situation. We might put them inside of us, depending. But uh, we are getting ready to hunker down here for the night. Got. 20 layers of hood on and all kinds of stuff on. So we're, uh, yeah, we're just getting ready to call it a night. We will have an audio recorder rolling. Actually gonna get that set up now. This guy will be running. I'll probably turn it off at some point when I'm sleeping, but always running and also it won't be good when we start snoring. So, all right, well, that's pretty much it. I guess, uh, see how the morning goes. It's gonna be a cold one, but it is what it is. We are awake. How you feeling, man? Pretty good. Definitely cold night, but wow, we were warm. These yeah, sleeping was... bags and zero degree sleeping bags and heat blankets, they really do a good job. We're gonna get the fire going and Start getting ready, but man, nothing happened. I mean, it was a pretty calm night last night. Didn't really have much going on. So we're back now from the, the trek out there, the expedition. Uh, just kind of recap, uh, it was about 12 degrees, I think the high, and feels like one degree with the wind chill. In terms of what happened, we didn't have a whole lot happen. No, it was a quiet night. We might have had a few points where we heard, maybe potentially heard some things off right. in the distance. Um, it was really hard to say with the wind. Um, it just it just made it really hard to really listen through all that noise um, yeah. for, for stuff like you know that we were looking for. We saw some tracks, some deer scat, moose scat, that a, kind of stuff. A lot of both. Yeah, that was the probably the the most uh, prominent thing that we saw was tracks on the way in. Um, on, I think on Saturday today we found a couple of piles of scat, which yeah. we hadn't really seen up until that point. Um, nothing too too recent, but definitely a sign that things are still moving through that area. Yeah, um, awesome. on the regular. Overall, it was a good time. And yeah, it was hopefully great. We can go back there at some point, but I guess we'll have to look at the, review the audio and review the trail camera footage as well. For sure, yeah. Hopefully we'll have some, some hits picked up on that. Nothing quite turned up on the trail camera, and the audio didn't yield much either. While this might discourage some, more often than not, nothing happens while searching for something as elusive as Sasquatch. What encourages me is hearing the sightings and stories from people living close to the woods, especially in a state like New Hampshire, where the subject is still socially taboo. This case is one of many like it across North America. I hope to continue following up with Chris and those involved. Meanwhile, the search continues beyond the trail.